Hello, I'm Susan Elliott. I'm the news and special reports editor for Musical America. We're gonna be talking today with Francesca Zambello. Francesca is the artistic director of the Washington National Opera and the general and artistic director of the Glimmerglass Festival in Cooperstown, New York. We're gonna uh, talk a little bit about what's been going on with both of those companies during the pandemic and what they plan to do coming out of it. Also, I wanna ask her about the impact of all of these different digital projects that opera companies and orchestras as well have been doing during the pandemic, um, the dependence on digital, how that might impact the field going forward, especially in terms of repertoire. Hello, Francesca. Hello, Susan, it's a pleasure to see you. Yeah, same here, same here. So you are now in, where are you now? What city are you I, in? I, I, most of the time I have been in Cooperstown in New York City and Washington, but right now I am in a family event in Georgia in a hotel room. So oh my uh, it's, it feels very different uh, after oh, having goodness. been in the same places for a long time. Oh, indeed, indeed. Actually, a lot has been going on since the beginning of the pandemic in both companies. Uh, like many of my colleagues, we have all learned a lot of new skills. Most mm. of them are online and virtual. Um, so in Glimmerglass, first of all, we last summer began a series called uh, Glimmerglass Glimpses where we produced weekly content uh, of short nature because it seemed like people's attention span was like 30 minutes. And yeah. we continued with a lot of different things through the whole winter. Um, and now we are gearing up for the summer, which uh, we can talk about in a second, I hope. Uh, and in Washington, we've really had a, a range of projects from last fall, um, it was all under the title of Come Hope, which okay. is uh, back to Leonora's aria in Fidelio, Come Hoffnung, which we okay. should have opened our season with. And so we had a range of programming, which I call really from high tech to street theater. Um, we filmed episodes of Fidelio in VR and just recorded our orchestra to accompany it, kind of mini episodes of Fidelio. We had an opera truck out in the streets performing with our young artists. We commissioned a work for families called Slopera by Carlos Simon and Mo Willem. We also ran our American Opera Initiative program, which is the short operas that we do right. with emerging composers and librettists. So that's, that's online there. That's now. That's online now, yeah. That's, that's yes. Now. And then we've had uh, really, like, I feel like it's like from VR to in the street, guerrilla opera. Uh, we made a number of other films uh, with Janae Bridges and Ryan McKinney. We have just been very busy creating a lot of different things all year because like everybody you want to stay in touch with your audience and your subscribers and your donors and you want to you know stay with them we actually are about to announce our season for next year uh, right. next week for me it was really important to get artists back to work musicians chorus and to focus on that above anything else so we in the fall we are not doing productions on stage we're doing a big event uh for four nights which is full of repertory that's really about artists Tannhäuser, William Tell, La Boheme uh and this event will also honor RBG who was of course one of our greatest friends and part of the company in a way and this is our first chance to really do something for her. What about, weren't you just beginning to work on Blue when you shut down last March? Uh, what happened? Is that, are we gonna see that soon? Um, we premiered Blue by Janine Tesori and Taswell Thompson 
uh, at the Glimmer Glass Festival right. in 2019. Right. We were right. just about to open uh, at the Kennedy Center when the pandemic hit. So right. we closed down. Uh, we have programmed it for the future. Um, I cannot, I know when, but I don't want to announce that yet. But the sure. great thing is, is that this June, we will be doing a recording with the cast, cast recording, as cool. well as making a documentary about the piece. Wonderful. And of course, it, we programmed it and produced it before George Floyd. And amazing. It was just very prescient. Uh, so I'm thrilled that we will do it at WNO, and I know other theaters are programming it as well. Great. So moving on to Glimmerglass, how is uh, Glimmerglass on the grass coming? <laughs> um, well, I am fortunate to have an amazing staff because uh, after going through everything this year, we decided that we could not go back in the theater now we will, of course, we have the most beautiful 900 seat jewel box theater. Uh, but we decided that we wanted to be as safe as possible and to put people back to work as quickly as possible. And so we have come up with glimmer glass on the grass. We're doing, we're building an outdoor stage, which is very much inspired by all the great outdoor stages, the Elizabethan stages, the Delacorte in Central Park. Right. Uh, Epidaurus in Greece. I mean, it's not that big. Um, <laughs> and then we uh, really, it, it is just a, a beautiful stage in wood uh, so that the focus is on the performers. Everyone buys a square that they can sit in with their chairs. They can have four people in a square. And then we also have designed kind of Adirondack lean-tos, which we call festival boxes, which encircle everything. And you can have... Uh, eight of your nearest and dearest friends in one of those. And so oh. we also are, we, we just, safety was number one. So we decided to make adaptations of all the pieces we're doing. Right. They are 90 minutes each, um, no intermissions. Uh, and the performance times are always 11 in the morning or five or six in the afternoon. And Currently, we have reached our capacity. We reached our capacity immediately, like in five days. Wow. But Governor Cuomo has just announced that the capacity can increase. So we are about to go to our waiting list to call everybody, and then we will put it back on public sale. But again, we want to be very cautious and make sure that we can con control everybody there, make sure everybody feels safe and comfortable, not just audiences, but all the artists. So... I am thrilled about the logistics. I'm very nervous because everything is new. Everything everybody does now is new. Um, and then I'm absolutely thrilled artistically about the programming. And then we have three premieres. Um, the first on stage will be The Passion of Mary Cardwell Dawson. Right. She founded something called the National Negro Opera Company which performed during the 40s and 50s. She was an incredible pioneer, and this company toured all over America and did standard repertory. And that is going to star Denise Graves. And then we have two other world premieres, which we have decided to film and not do on the stage. Um, one of them is called The Knock, which is part of a, a series that we are doing called Common Ground that's going to go for three years. It's right. all new works to try and find, to present operas about how we find common ground. How do we connect with diverse groups? The other new work, which we're going to be performing actually in a number of different places, as well as filming it, is called On Track by Nick Benvenides. It's a dance piece. And choreography and dancer is Amanda Castro. And it is really about agriculture and machinery and how we work with machinery and the land, which is very appropriate for where we are, which is a lot of farm country. So this single woman dance piece uses sounds of tractors, uh, soundtrack from different farmers, as well as music by Nick. 
And it is something that we are going to be performing in a number of different venues, including the New York pop-ups next month, and then we'll be filming it. So I'm thrilled. We actually have three premieres, two big concert events, and three operas. We have a lot happening. Our audience is going to become so used to sort of shorter evenings, earlier evenings, um, uh, seeing things, seeing so much uh, on film, whether it's on a stage or on a screen. How is that going to impact the field going forward? I think it's here to stay. I don't think that it will take the place of everything. I think that the sensation of live and being in community and being in a theater with other people is very important. And I think that people yearn for that kind of human connection and that it will come back when we are all together in a theater, it might be different for some time. And of mm -hmm. course, artistically, we will think, how are we going to produce these works in a way that speaks to us today? Not just, I, I'm talking about like philosophically right now, as well as like social distancing. I think that virtual parts of our world are here to stay. And part of that is because we're creating so much new work or interpretations of existing work or rethinking these pieces. And I think that part of that is economic. Um, you can create a lot of these things for reasonable amounts of money. You can't make as much money though. We have not figured out how do we charge money for these things and really make the kind of money that you make when you have a full house in a theater. And right. I think that that's going to be a difficult balance is going to be urging people to come back and spend money for tickets after a lot of the content they've been getting has been free. And right. so there's going to be an adjustment period, I think, for several years where we determine with an audience, really, what do they want to pay for? You know, in part, we will offer them things, but also they're going to tell you what, what they want to see and do. But I yeah. do hear over and over, I want to be in a theater. I want to be with people. I mean, theater is a communal experience. It is a, it is a religion. It is like being in a temple together. You know, you, when you attend a great performance with an audience around you, and it's that one unique time together, not something that you, oh, let's, down, let's stream that later tonight when we go home. That's, yeah, that's so true. And, uh, and, and I think turning people on to that who, who haven't experienced, who come to this art form in the last year, I think, they're, I think that a percentage of them will gravitate. It's, you know, I also think it's important to realize how we did it before was already breaking down. It's not like the pandemic changed, you know, sort of, it right. just accelerated it. Mm -hmm. So it's our job to reinvent things and to come up with new things. Um, that's what we're here. That's why we're artists is to keep right. rethinking it. I do think, you know, Aida, Bohem and Carmen are not going to go away. There is always going to be an audience for them. Like I say, it's how are we going to produce it? You know, yeah. to what, you know, the, are we making um, adaptations? Is it with a chorus the way we've heard it before? Is it with an orchestra? Is it with the same amount of solo? It's, how, you know, all of that remains to be seen. And again, you know, this discussion, artistic and economic really have to go hand in hand. And those are things that I spend a lot of time thinking about, about, you know, what is a creative solution to something? Not just like, oh, like we can't afford that, but rather like figure out a creative way to do something, mm -hmm. find a way to do it a new way. Um, and I think, you know, that that's going to be that is a big part of what we're all doing right now every general director artistic director every artist and of course there is going to be a shedding there is already a shedding of people and some of them are very very good people but some people it it, it just may be a natural process um as we come to what is the new world of opera and and classical music i i i do put them together in some ways but in another way i feel like opera we are you know, we don't have the constraints of an orchestra or a symphony setup. You know, of course, we're, we're working with an orchestra, but 
how we use that orchestra, the number of players, where we put them, you know, how they interact, the theatrical component is completely different. And again, it's also like, are we going to, you know, we're performing outside. Other people are going to be performing in big warehouses. It's going to be a while before people want to sit shoulder to shoulder. Right. I do think that. Well, it's also, it, it's kind of, you know, necessity and the mother of invention and all those good things coming together. But there's also going to have to be an awful lot more flexibility uh, among the different constituents that put together an opera company. You know, look at the chorus, the orchestra, the principals, the administration, and that whole concept of working communally internally is foreign, has been in the past foreign that's going to have to change no that's that is very much going to have to change um but of course as you know there's a lot of contention right now between a lot of these groups so i would be cautious what i would comment on right now of course, you know, of it, course. it is it is my desire of course to have as many people back at work as we possibly can and right. in a collaborative fashion yeah. The best things yeah. happen when there is combustion with a lot of people who work together to for one single end. Correct. Right. In a normal year, <laughs> if there is such an animal, mm -hmm. um, how do you divide? Where are you based? Are you based in Washington? Um, no, I'm, uh, I used to be based on Amtrak and Acela. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, well, my wife is an attorney, uh, and she also happens to, her name is Faith, and she is the interim pastor at our church in Cooperstown, because aside from being an attorney, she got her degree at Yale Divinity School a few years ago and is standing in for the pastor. So the past basically, I don't know, 14, 15 months, we have lived in Cooperstown, where we have a home, and that's where Glimmerglass Festival is located. Our son goes to school in New York City, but he has been on Zoom, digital yeah. school. So he's been living in the country. And then I also have a home in D.C., actually right near the Kennedy Center. To what degree has the Zooming for both companies helped <laughs> to increase your audience, your exposure? Well, there's no question the internet, you know, everyone's numbers have grown exponentially sure. uh, through, but, it, but it's like, how many of those people are going to stay with us? How many of those people are going to commit to us? How many of those people are going to give us money or buy tickets? You know, they may buy something and that's, you know, the economics of the new world is going to take time to figure out because the conventional ways of, selling tickets and raising money is very different. I mean, we've all done like virtual galas now. So, you know, that, that's a very different experience. Um, you know, we've all had cocktail parties with donors and subscribers and other artists. Um, and of course it's very facile doing it on Zoom, but it, it's, it's just, of course, not the same, but you right. can cover this. I think that this kind of virtual running of an arts organization, some of it is going to stay with us. And I feel, you know, what, it, what helped in both WNO and Glimmerglass is that we have incredible staff and we were already very solid as a group. And so we already had a shorthand. I think what's hard is to create new relationships, new artistic ways of thinking, with new with new people where you haven't had that you know that 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 community that touch together well, i think we'll come out of this and we'll be stronger i think you're right 